The band he had with his sister in the 80s wasn't quite as successful. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. The church has got on mandate. Get it on. And welcome to the program. We got a one on three going, as Dawson told you, with Hanson. Uh, most talented, nicest guys in music. And I'll just open it up to all show business. <laughs> Isaac Taylor and Zach all <laughs> back you. in the studio. Good to see you guys. Are you saying that we're honorary Canadians? <laughs> yes, Canadians are nice. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. For that I yeah. literally spent this morning with Howie Mandel, who's a Canadian. Right, right. Very was, nice man. And I was doing his podcast, but his daughter was born here. Oh. And oh, she so was is... on the podcast, and we were arguing about COVID, and he kept turning to her going, honey, honey, <laughs> come, come slow your roll. And it's like, <laughs> he's Canadian, but we we weaponized her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's American now. <laughs> Those uh, feisty Americans, uh, nothing yeah. but trouble. Well, we... <laughs> How did you guys maintain your niceness in your your sanity and and i will say that i've been sitting here and they came in and we set up and they recorded but and i can you know when the mics are hot people act a certain way yeah like maybe ellen but (laughs) when the mics cool down people treat the tech guys and the roadie guys a little bit differently and bandmates but you guys are very magnanimous and friendly Mm. to each other and to the crew on and off the mic. Yeah, I, well. I think we believe in the theory that you uh, that you get what you give. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and and also you don't ask people to do things you're not willing to do yourself. You know, when someone's handling your instrument all day and you're going to walk in front of a camera or onto a mic <laughs> and they'll hand it to you, they could do so many terrible things to it, right? <laughs> yeah, look, it'd right? be out of it's tune. It's really thank you for giving me an yeah. in tune instrument and you know but, taking care of me, not making me look like an ass. It's also really interesting. You know, I mean, we we broke out so early, and we this year we've been a band for thirty years because we started 30 when years. I was nine. I'm, 30, I'm 39. Wow. and and. It never stops to amaze. It never ceases to amaze me how low the expectations are for people in our job. Because I mean, last week I had somebody walked up to me and said, "You know what? I love your band because you actually play your instruments." Yes. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that would be like going up to a talk show host and saying, "Like, I love your talk show because you talk." Yeah. <laughs> no, it... <laughs> be like, I love your. Or you your have a pants. good vocabulary. Yeah. It's like no. It's just. It's like the expectation of of us in a way I think should probably be higher. Um, And we've always, I mean, our heroes were guys that had career, you know, had longevity. I mean, once we, that was always the, when it first record broke, it wasn't like, well, let's cash in for the next week. This is going to be great. You're saying we should do the opposite with bands, what we do with politicians, right? We should think less of politicians and expect more. Well, definitely (laughs) that's true. (laughs) That's definitely true. Uh, At least expect music. If it says musician next to you to like actually know how to make music. Well, I, you know, here's kind of with the world we're living in. Everyone just has so much room on their hard drive and then they hear Hanson and they think, Oh, those teeny boppers from back in the day. Mm -hmm. And then when you, harmonize the way you harmonize when you play your instruments, the way you yeah. play your instruments, when you make the sound live, and I'm sitting here experiencing it, as I did before when you guys came in the studio, I think everyone is duly impressed, but there's always that part where they had in whatever's left in their hard drive for yeah. you is these kids course, with probably yeah. some showbiz mom who yeah. overdubbed yeah. this and that, and maybe they got <laughs> Millie Vanilli's <laughs> real singers to cover Umbop or something. And so then we see you do it and we're impressed, but I don't know what we were expecting. Yeah. And, and then you guys have to go out and kind of feel mm. like you have to prove it. Yeah, all yeah. the time. Well, the amazing thing is oh, that that is tr- without a chip on your shoulder, like, <laughs> <laughs> to some degree. Yeah, yeah. No kidding, yeah, exactly. To some there degree, but it's. I mean, the, the thing is, mostly we we figured out pretty early on. I mean, for one, you're never going to get everybody. You're just not. Um, yeah. But you, so you got to go for the people that are with you. I mean, you find those people. You find you say find your yeah. tribe, and you find the the real fan, and and you breathe. You kind of. You put all your energy into those, and you build from that, and and that's where your that's where the power is. Yeah. That's that's the, the you and, and your people like coming out to a show. You don't if you only sang one song that everyone knows you for like twenty four times a night, you would lose your mind. But you play it once or twice, you know. Yeah. In a, in a <laughs> not twice a night. Not, not twice, twice a night. night. No, no, I was definitely say, not. You know, what they don't tell you when you become famous is that being famous is like going to a family reunion 
every day of every your day. freaking mm. life, right? Yes. And everyone you meet is some distant relative that you have no <laughs> idea who they are, and they haven't seen you in 25 years, and they have no idea what <laughs> you're doing. They're like, oh, you're bigger. Except oh, for your couple older. cousins that are right. close by that live down the street. <laughs> but there's a, there's a version <laughs> of it. I mean, there's a version of notoriety and fame that I've described as sort of like a high school reunion versus a family reunion. Okay. Like, so yeah. I've been pulled over by a million motorcycle cops and yes. mostly they go, Oh, Hey man show. <laughs> and then they go, Hey, you like cars. I like cars. Ironically, the guys like the cars the most ride motorcycles for of the course, police department. Right. They're exactly. all car guys. And then they go, yeah. so in Jay Leno's garage. And the next, you know, you don't yeah. get a ticket. So yeah. if that guy was a guy you went to high school with, you'd get the same thing. Exactly. You, yeah. you the guy yeah. you played football with or whatever. So it's not all a hassle. No, no, it's, no. It's definitely, no, definitely not. good. No, 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 no definitely not. A lot I mean, of it's amazing. A lot of it's, <laughs> it, but there is a lot of, um, definitely there's that, that familiarity without actual familiarity, I think is part of what Zach is saying, where you feel yes. there's a sense of familiarity, but, and but you're not, but you don't have a tight relationship. And, and Most of the associations are positive. Well, I mean, you do occasionally get the, you know, the high school bully that just won't leave you alone but, well it, it, all i'm saying i'm not saying something negative i mean yeah. your your distant aunt or second cousin they're happy to see you oh and yeah they really want the best for you and they want to know what's going on they just aren't paying attention right well, yeah. they just yeah. aren't there with you every because you're not there with their at their house with their kids doing yeah. the high school so thing think, and the whatever i yeah, think exactly. when you can put it in the context of like when people recognize you or know you for something you did a long time ago or uh, just aren't aware of what you're in the middle of right it's it's not an insult. It's not something to be like have a chip on your shoulder about. It's just like, hey, I've got to bring you up to well, speed. Well, they yeah, also. Yeah. I ran into a, a semi drunken uh, couple couple of ladies last night at a Mexican food restaurant <laughs> who they want to get you back into the format they're familiar with. Right. Like, they're, right. oh, Adam, oh yeah, hey, hey, what are you doing? You know, and I go I'm doing right. a podcast. We gotta get you back on the radio, like because you own a radio. <laughs> you have a fucking phone, woman. Why don't you listen to me on the podcast? She's like, oh, you gotta get back on the radio. That's yeah, like where my, it was. My podcast show is bigger than my radio show. <laughs> yeah, it's like saying, oh, the man show's canceled. You need to come over and stand on my TV set and, and act. <laughs> it's like, use your computer, woman. Exactly. The album, by the way, Red, Green, Blue. It's uh, out as we speak. It's available wherever you stream music. And yes. there's kind of an interesting story behind this, which is it's everyone wrote a third of the album, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. And was that done... Uh, it, it, to avoid a fist <laughs> fight. To avoid a fist fight? Or why was that done? I mean, sort of, a little Sometimes. bit. Sometimes. There, there's a lot in there. I mean, we've been a band for a long time when people say, do you fight? It's like, yes, how often? But um, we also we fight know, like champs. We know <laughs> how to be together and we know how, you know, when it's time to do something different and when it's time to change your focus. This project wasn't really about that. This was something that had been floating around for five years, maybe a little longer. And at 30 years of being a band, it, it's really more interesting to tell stories than it is to write songs, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so this was kind of, I think to me, it was about, we're, we're a unique dynamic where you have three people who sing, three people who write, three people who can produce and be their own artist, but we choose to do it together. There mm. just aren't many that I know to compare to that. Like, yeah. You know, the Beatles did that. Who else every member sang? Like the Bee Gees? Yeah, I mean, there's the Bee Gees are like that. I mean, we're odd in the sense that we started off really young. Doo wop, early like soul music, early rock and roll. Like those were our models. And so harmony and kind of melody, those were always key. So that's been the 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 foundation of the sound of no matter what else we're doing, you know, harmonizing is a big part of it. So you, yeah, there's three, three creative people. It's also doing things you've never done before, uh, which is kind of like the stories thing that you're talking about. Yeah. We, we, cause we get all the time, like, why haven't you guys broken up and done solo records and things like that? And you're like, don't, well, don't, well, don't tempt me. I mean, like a week ago, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was, I was thinking about it. No, I'm just kidding. I think uh, or, it's, it's important it's, to do things you're not a hundred percent comfortable with. If yeah, you want to make good art. Yeah, right, agreed. and I, I think all of us had sort of slightly different hurdles to come over with this project, but yeah, it was like, hey, this is what we need to do to kind of start the next chapter of being a band, going into thirty first year. Like, what are we gonna do that continues to force us to be a better band? Well, because we have to be better individuals in order to be a better yeah, band. Absolutely, about thirty years, so you're thirty six. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, six, yeah. So, how yeah. much Easy of enough. it feels like a dream? 
I mean, uh, early, I don't remember what I was doing when I was six. I, I was, certainly wasn't, you know, wowing any crowds. Yeah. I was wedding something probably <laughs> or getting in trouble some way. But you were wedding. We were playing weddings. Yeah. Yes. It was yeah. I mean, you guys didn't, uh, you guys were around for three, four years before yeah, you exploded, yeah. well, right? We, we did. I mean, we did what bands do, only you can't really play bars and stuff when you're a kid. So we would do like arts fairs and block parties. We'd do anywhere you could stand and somebody would listen. And kind of the, Going school joke. assemblies, yeah. you know, that we kind figured of out. Oh my god, we could like get a captive audience of a school assembly because we met a um, a teacher that said you should come to our school, and that was kind of like local like, panda. It was like panda. motivational speaking slash playing. But music. I, again, <laughs> a part of it you have to get the paradigm. Again, we we had seen we had this weird microcosm where we I'm sure we told this story before, but we had this. Our dad worked for a, a lot of oil and gas companies in Tulsa, and he took the job nobody really wanted, which was to go to South America with his four kids at the time, young kids. To, he was an accountant, and he kind of audited these you know operations. And, and so we spent a year plus in in South America as his, you know, family entourage. Ex- entourage. <laughs> and so we didn't really have a lot of cultural influences as little kids, but we had these couple tapes, which were compilations of songs from the early rock and roll era. And I think we got this concentrated input of this particular thing. And so when we came back and started singing when I was, you know, eight, nine years old, and yeah. we, we just thought, well, Jackson 5 were teenagers, the Beach Boys, the Beatles. It was like, you know, Stevie Wonder. We just figured little this Stevie is it. Wonder. Little Stevie, yeah, little Wonder. Stevie Wonder. And so yeah. we just we just kind of thought, well, it's time to go sing and do this thing. And when people respond to what you do, you kind of it's like you keep getting applause. You go, okay, I'll try that again. <laughs> well, here's a you philosophical know? question because um, I was watching the uh, Cheryl Crow documentary the other right. night, which, by the way, she spells her name S H instead of C H. Mm-hmm. So I spent a half hour tr- doing the search. Come on, Cheryl Crow. Come on, I know it's out. I know it's out. No, we got nothing. Cheryl Hines? No, not Cheryl Hines. Cheryl Crow. Cheryl Crow. Yeah. Do you think the TV's smart enough to figure this shit out by now? It's Cheryl Crow. An I'm er- sorry. I'm an arrow like plus a, human. a crow. We should right. be able to figure out. How many this other out? crow people are there? But really? Yeah. What I was saying is, is you know, they were. You know, she's old. Older than than you guys are, but yeah. she spent her time. She grew up, oh God, in a in a smallish town. Isn't is she from Missouri? Missouri, or yeah. yeah, and yeah. she's a small town in Missouri. And so she f- spent her time in front of the piano and mm-hmm. looking at albums from James Taylor and Fleetwood Mac and yeah. all the usual suspects and just list, sitting in a room. All yeah. these stories start with just sitting, listening over and over and over again. Yeah. Well, yeah. my kids are doing a thousand different things and they're doing them all today. Like they ain't sitting, listening right. over and over to Michael Jackson's or Sam and Dave or whoever, yeah. whoever it is. They're, listening to. they're, they're spread out a million different directions sure. yeah. and they're learning a little about something, but then they're quickly getting bored with it and moving on. So yeah. I'm wondering like, how do we do this in the future with everyone's got a phone and right. they've got a big screen TV and they're going to play yeah. laser tag at yeah. the place. It's and a challenge. Yeah, you guys it's... sort of were sequestered in a weird way yeah. and forced to learn this yeah, I, or I think appreciate it. Maybe, well, yeah. maybe the last two years will produce some geniuses will say, well, then everything stopped and I couldn't leave my house, you know? Right. You know, but no, I, no, I, I think, think they're probably just going to get really good at Fortnite. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I think there's, you know, this is, this is my particular perspective. I don't know if everybody quite shares this, but I was discussing this with my wife and I, it kind of hit me early on in, in raising our kids. You know, we have a bunch of kids, I have seven kids and, um, all amazing, but it occurred to me that they I, can't all be amazing. Yeah, but keep well, going. They're, yeah. they're amazing to me. Um, <laughs> two of them have to be. Yeah, no, no, no. What he, but when he says amazing, he means it's amazing. They're all alive. Yeah, I, I love, or, or amazing. I, let's just say like better. Fascinating. I love my kids. Everybody loves their kids. Um, but it occurred to me that I had, whether or not been successful, I tried to be really good at something early in life. And I think trying to be good at something, even whatever it is, like just trying to get yourself to push yeah. yourself to something, like I'm going to try and be a good soccer player. I'm going to try and learn to play piano. I'm going to, is really yeah. good because you figure out what you're made of in a way. You figure out like, can I, like, where's, where do I, where am I like, pressure point? I don't think I'm going to try that hard. Like yeah. just trying, even if you, if it's just getting, you know, whatever that skill is, it does sort of, begin to get you go, okay, that's what it's going to take for me to get that good at anything. And so I, I don't know if everybody needs to go crazy with something and get, but having that idea of just attempting to pour yourself into something does sort of prepare you to be, okay, well, you know, I'm going to try the next thing. Sort of like people that learn a language. Once you learn a language, they say, hey, it's a lot easier to learn another one. Um, I think there is something to that. 
See, uh, a lot of people will say, you guys seem kind of normal, right? You guys mm-hmm. seem kind of normal. And um, we're not normal at all. We're completely obsessive and psychotic. Like, six years old, you started your band. What kind of crazy kids are that obsessive <laughs> about something? Exactly. Right? If your kids, if you want them to be really good at something and they're obsessive about that thing you hate, probably just let them do it. Right, probably let them do it until they're so good at it, and that's the only thing they care about. Then one day, somebody go, "Wow, how did you become a multi-million-dollar video game, you know, a personality?" Or, <laughs> yeah. you know, but were you that into it at six, or were you just trying to keep the brothers happy? And <laughs> well, I, I didn't do I didn't do anything consciously for a long time because at six, you're you're operating purely on instinct. So right. So uh, you know, Zach jumped in with yeah. His... It wasn't it wasn't my dream at all. And it, truth be told, it's not my only dream now, but it's something I enjoy and something that something you spend... practiced a lot at and are really good at. Yeah. I wouldn't want to not be able to do it. Like making music, like this project. When we went into the studio and, and did the blue songs, the five blue songs with Jim and David, that was probably two of my favorite weeks of my entire life. You know, it was such a joy to just go in and have a, something in your mind and see it become reality. Well, yeah. speaking of the songs and the new songs, I think we have a new one to play. Now, mm-hmm. just uh, full disclosure, I've already heard it, but it was only moments ago because we're taping out of order and it was great, but. I'll play it for you guys, and you tell me if you concur. It's called Write You a Song. One, two. Well, I'm going to write you a song. I see blue skies, sunrise, dandelions and conversations, chasing butterflies through the garden. You were barefoot in the living room, dancing around, you always couldn't lose all of those memories that etched in my mind. So I'm gonna write you a song. Something sweet that you can all belong to But when the night gets long So you got me there to remind you Of all of our good times And the beautiful light you shine That is why I'm gonna write you a song So you'll never be lonely You're my Oklahoma daisy And the sparkle in your eyes saves me From life's tribulations and trials I hear choirs of angels singing Every time you call my name The kingdom of heaven is in your smile So I'm gonna write you a song Something sweet that you can all belong to But when the night gets long So you got me there to remind you Of all of our good times And the beautiful light you shine That is why I'm gonna write you a song So you'll never be lonely So you'll never be lonely I'm gonna write you a lullaby A hush, baby, don't cry So that when I'm gone You can sing along I'm gonna write you I'm gonna write you a song So you never be lonely See, in real time, I'd be like, oh, man, that was so awesome. But it was only 40 minutes ago I heard it. So it was, it was awesome. Wait, now, so whose song is Write You a Song? 
Write your songs from the green portion of the record, and that's that's, that's me. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. and um, and it was it, that particular song was kind of a fun, special one to write. It's actually about my daughter because uh, she said to me about three days, two days before that song was written, "Daddy, you never write me any songs." It was a very emotional eight year old kind of conversation, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, but anyway, we had a friend coming through town. He's a great songwriter named Paul McDonald, and uh, he and I started talking about what we we're going to write about, and he actually of his own volition had an idea about what if we wrote a song about somebody, uh, you know, for someone the, and, and, and that was kind of the context. And it's so like, you're I, like, oh, that's, yeah, you're reading my, my mind. That's exactly what my daughter just said. Like two days ago. No, you're so, reading your daughter's mind. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Which is weird. You're I'm, just taking orders and exactly. she's only eight. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, so we, so we wrote the song for her and she was there half the time. She really liked it. So how do you guys maintain your appreciation for all the, bounty of gifts that you have in your life. Cause so many people yeah. get so burnt out and sort of miserable and show businesses highs and lows. Mm-hmm. And you guys were, you know, the most <laughs> played band of 1997 or, yeah. or, or eight. Yeah. Now you're working band yeah. and a working band who releases albums and goes to Europe and yeah. you're not playing the bar scenes out here in Hermosa beach, yeah. but I just no. mean you always seem to have the great appreciation for the music. Also the great appreciation for each other than the great appreciation for, you know, I've, I've had conversations with people who feel like they're lower down on the showbiz um, totem pole because all they do is play cruise ships. And I just right. go, you don't have a job. You play cruise ships. <laughs> you do stuff it's you can do in your sleep for 20 minutes twice uh, yeah. two sh- in, in, in a weeks long cruise and then you're first class passenger. Why? How could yeah. you possibly complain about it? But a lot of people yeah. figure out a way to do that. What? You guys... I think, probably a couple, that. I think there's probably a couple of answers. I mean, the, f- the first one that comes to mind, although there are many things, because uh, it's not just one, but one of the things I think is that we, it's not that you're not chasing success and fame, but I think that there's a quality to which we weren't chasing it. And I think I think when, when it came down to it, you know, when you're trying to escape uh, the chaos uh, of, of the fame that you find in, you know, especially off that first record, Middle of Nowhere, back in 97, 98, you know, we didn't say, oh, let's buy uh, a really fancy house in the Hollywood Hills and hide away up there. We said, let's buy 100 acres outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we're from, and let's hide out there. And I think some of those things make a Reality difference. Reality check, yeah. It's, you, you know what I mean? Like, and the work and, ethic, too. I think yeah. we grew up with with yeah. just work ethic and, and kind of valuing the sweat equity in a, in a different way. I mean, I yeah. think a lot of bands did. Um, but I, I actually think part of it is... Um, trying to to always be looking forward, you know. I mean, wherever you are, yeah. is not where you're going, right? It's not. It's. I mean, I love being present. That's important. But we're thinking about, oh, what's next? Where are you headed? And that that you're aspiring to stuff. You're you're kind of, you know, you're working towards something and and trying to keep that mindset. I don't know if that's, um, you know, nobody's got a corner on the market, but that has definitely been part of. I think what's kept us. Um, overcoming stuff is pretty much every day you're doing this job you're fighting to be one of those two percent of the universe of musicians that could actually like, call it their job so we we just i think have continued to feel like we were lucky to do it i'm looking at a note on my screen that says uh you work with the blues traveler yes on their 2015 album yeah and uh I just got a text from John Popper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You got to love John Popper, right? Oh, yeah. He's a yeah, feisty yeah. guy. He, yeah. he looked at us in 1999 when we were making our second record. He, he, guessed he it played on. on our second yeah. record, He too. said, guys, he said, sit down. We were sitting at Music Grinder Studio, which which I don't think is there. I don't anymore. think it exists. Um, and um, he goes, he was doing the harmonica part, and he goes, guys, let me just, here's the deal. Make the lunch boxes. Take, take the, the cash. <laughs> 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 he said, just, I'm, he's like, no one's ever going to put me on a lunchbox. Just forget about credibility. <laughs> just do it. Uh, which we didn't do, but uh, it's, it was hilarious. And we actually, we had a lot of fun. We wrote, it, wrote a tune uh, on their, one of their last more recent records. I guess it was five years ago, probably now. Yeah, yeah, plus, uh, it was yeah. a lot of fun um, and played it with the guys. And uh, that was yeah. very cool. Yeah, he's ge- he's genius. They're uh, still a great band. And, and I, first off, I'm I'm a huge fan of Blue Traveler, but um, 
and you know, maybe not a lunchbox for John Popper, but if, <laughs> if they had a dinner box, yeah, I feel like he could fill that out quite quite nicely. More of a briefcase, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, something with wheels on it. <laughs> also, John is a really tall guy. Yeah, he's, yeah. A, he's a big I mean, dude. I, I like, mean, like he's fan, a big man, fantastic no, band, big personality. Fantastic. The thing about John. Popper is he sings so good. Oh my gosh. Yes, and he he's so good at the harmonica that people go, oh, that guy plays the harmonica. When you really hear, hear him belt sing. it out. Oh my God, he can sc- sing his ass off. Yeah. He can sing his ass off, but it gets sometimes a little lost in the harmonica <laughs> yeah. shuffle. So um, I feel you. Yeah. And a guy who. I think if he set his mind to it, he could do stand-up comedy. Like he's <laughs> he's, pre- he's yes, pretty very quick. smart, very very yes, smart, he's absolutely good on his feet. And he yeah. shot a squirrel in his house, <laughs> and he sent me a picture of a squirrel with a hole in it. Uh, uh, my Surpri- favorite story. I'm surprised he didn't shoot it with a My favorite. My favorite. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's one of my favorite stories. He didn't shoot with a BB gun yeah, or no, or no, an no, air gun or probably a wrist 22. rocket. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It yeah. was a pistol, and I don't even know if it was a twenty. It was like a German, you know. He's, he's got yeah. thirty pistols on him at all times. Yeah. My favorite really thing does, was yeah. it was uh, Johnny Lang, who we're also good friends with, sure. who also is an amazing player and singer and fantastic guy. And he uh, he was like, "Yeah, I was I was on the road with uh, I was on the road, and I don't remember whether he was on the road with John or what, but he like ended up staying at John's house, I think in Pennsylvania. They're friends, and they're friends. Saying. And John's like, you know, out in the back with the big old like black powder cannon, <laughs> cans of dog food, just being like. Poof. He yeah, shoots she, cans of dog food yes. from it, like a Civil War can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, just all kinds of things. John is very fond of the explosive devices. I think that's, I think that's in Oregon or something. Is that in I don't Oregon? think it's, I think you have Pennsylvania is like a setting for a Civil War <laughs> <laughs> or, or Revolutionary War, yeah, you know, yeah, so you put the can in there. You don't yeah. think of the cannon as yeah. outside of Portland yeah. as much, not as many battles fought. I do think it always points but out he, all the characters, I mean, to do what, to do what is we've gotten to do and, and chose to do. And Zach said we we're psychotic, you know, whatever. He sees right. Yeah. I think there, there, it takes a certain kind of obsession, a certain kind of, you know, everybody's not made, you know, the makeup to tour, to play, to write songs and be like a cave dweller and then go out and go do the performance thing. I mean, you're, like, you have to almost be bipolar. You you go from this side of the spectrum to the other. And I think it's so, it's surviving. It's really sort of being in this world is kind of a survival uh, more than just a, a career. You kind of have to have some somewhat of a, a sense that there isn't really a normal and and you just kind of keep climbing the hill and um if you don't sort of get a lot if you don't get a lot of energy out of the the couple things you do which are very by part of the hill climbing you know the, <laughs> right. then you then you would just go peace out like uh, give me my 9 to 5 but it 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 has you know it takes a certain kind of person to to want to put yourself through the those ends of the spectrum you know well you know so people say to me all the time oh you work so much you do all so much stuff and I always go, that's not really work, sitting around, right. talking to Hanson, right. about right. John Popper, <laughs> <laughs> in air conditioning. Not really. I don't consider that work. And then I always go, look, I used to work. I work construction. I, w- I know what it's like to be on a roof, stripping mm-hmm. asphalt tiles in August. Like, I worked, man, yeah. for a, not summers while I was going to college or any. I didn't go to anything. I just worked real work you know, crawling underneath houses, earthquake rehab, like everything Wow, for a long period of time. Yeah. yeah. So it's hard work. If, if Tucker Carlson is going to drive the van over to my house and have me do a five minute hit with hair and makeup, I don't consider that work. I, 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 I'm flattered. I don't consider this work. I don't consider no, no. most of what I do in this field right. is work, That's fantastic. but you guys don't have that base. Because, because <laughs> we didn't have to no, lay no. Out the so, shingles and do but, the thing. But yet we, I feel like we ended up in the same place, which is we both appreciate yeah. what we do, Absolutely. and while it is work, you don't really feel like work in a traditional sense. Like Absolutely, I think we have the, the same c- psychology somehow, though. Is the only is the way I would think of it, or something along those lines, which is maybe it was like when you're at the top of. You're when you're at the kind of top of the hill, top of the mountain, and dad looks at you and goes, hey, look, this can come and this can go. So appreciate every moment you got, you know, appreciate it, uh, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated, all that kind of stuff. And I think that that's absolutely part of it. You know, I, I think there's different kinds of work, too. And, and being on all the time from age six to age 36 is a kind of work. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Meeting every person 
when they're having a bad day or a good day and you just got to be on all the time is is a work it's 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 you know suppression of certain kinds of needs which ultimately is work and so i i think we've been working a long 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 time and we're lucky that um, you know, we choose to do this knowing we don't have to go to work, right? We could live off the royalties from the records we've released. We could probably live off of Umbop and just not do anything, right? Yeah. But we choose to get up and work and spend money on new dreams and new ideas. And and risk the farm <laughs> yeah. every day. Yeah. Did, you know. your, did your dad give you this speech about, you know, appreciate it <laughs> and here today, gone a, tomorrow? A, a, thousand a thousand times. A thousand times. A thousand and, times. And, and honestly, it worked. It worked. So, you know, if you've got kids, tell it to your kids a thousand times and they'll believe it. And they'll realize one day, you know, it's it's not even once you get it, you don't have yeah. it. You don't. Well, see, but I think it. it's even better that you show it. Right. Because I think it, I think dad did show it. Dad, dad was a kind of workaholic <laughs> type of he was, a, he was a doer. He doesn't like to stand still. And yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, is he be, still around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both, no, both of our parents he, he are. Work, he works for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. Well, he quit. He, he, he used happily that CPA quit his job. job. Yeah, he took this. He took his uh, certified, you know, public accountant skills. Yeah. And uh, our dad's idea of a great fun day <laughs> is to go plant about thirty trees, and then he'll buy you soft drinks and hot dogs afterwards. It's like it's wow. like this a is, reward. This is this is the best. Thing. Shared experience. Yeah. He just wants to move dirt around. You know, yeah. so, he's like so. the family that works together works together. Yeah. <laughs> well, he could have could be worse. He could have gone to work for Toby Keith. <laughs> oh I guess God. he was in the oil industry, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I guess he yeah. hit pretty big. Yep, yeah, that's true. He's a big. He's an Oki. Yeah. Yeah. Quick, yeah. zip your mouth, Toby Keith. Yeah. <laughs> well. So, yeah, sorry. Want to talk shit about Toby no. Keith? He'll put a boot in your ass. You no. do. Okay, no. is that him? Or is that another it is. guy? It's something like that. I look. I like. I want to talk about me. Maybe it's my theme song, but the Toby Keith song I want to talk about me makes me makes me laugh. It, Maybe no, it's because he it's yodels funny. in it. Or no, something. I mean he has a good sense of humor. <laughs> But about himself, I mean, I'm not. I'm not so sure about himself, though. Actually, I actually didn't really have anything to say. I think there was yeah. just an assumption that there was. Zach, Zach was assuming that look on my face meant I had something to say about Toby <laughs> Keith. So uh, your dad instilled it, but he lived it. I mean, yeah. you, you couldn't just say it. You know, you can't yeah. eat a donut. You, you can't smoke a cigarette through a donut and talk to your kid about health. <laughs> right. You, you got to be doing some push-ups, or they yeah. got to catch you doing some sit up somewhere, yeah, right? It's it's that. I mean the, the combination I mean of course now we're many years away from being the kids in the room. Now we all have kids and so you see the value of kind of the things you heard now in a different way. But you know, yet our mom who's really kind of the I'll ask anyone anything, the most confident human ever ever like cold she was our she was our promoter. She was our promoter agent type. before we had one. She'll show up and do anything and yeah. say anything, and and she, and he's the work ethic side. So it's like mm -hmm. the combined combined forces. Like and they know. both happen to be musically skilled and so, kind of but they didn't they, they didn't um, they didn't they were not stage parents. In fact, they were probably more cautious about the what it might do than than all right here we go. That the doers in both of them never made them into like. You know, this is our dream for you. It very much not that they just appreciated the shared experience. And yeah. but I, again, it's just I don't know if you somebody asked me the other day, well, are your kids ha you know happy with how they've grown up? And I said, well, we'll know in about twenty years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, we, Taylor, you're until closer, they write the book, you're, you're, you're closer than you're you closer than that. Okay, you have Ezra a will know in five years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, were your parents worried about the outside world and the influence? Like, are they religious people who yeah. thought, oh, there's just a bunch of satanic nut job, <laughs> drug dealing, drug doing, Hollywood yeah. record label I don't label think they were superstitious about it in that way, but I think they were cautious. Uh, honestly, you know, we, we don't talk about that as much. I mean, why are we normal? Well, probably because we have a real deep faith, spiritual background that, that said to us from moment one, hey... Um, this is not what you're living for, and also yeah. personal uh, restraint is valuable. You have um, <laughs> some kind of you purpose. have sort of an obligation yeah, to be a good human, right? To yeah. good to people, to good to your body, good to yourself. But I think honestly, actions have consequences. You know, when we talk about our parents, right? Stage parents, not stage parents. I think what they saw was almost like, wow, you've been given this gift that is kind of beyond. Something people normal. respond to it like the way wow. people are responding, the way you guys can sing together. I think there was almost like um, 
<laughs> Blues Brothers, it's a message from God a little bit. Uh, not in a weird way, but just in a, wow, you've been given this. You need to do something with it. Right. You need to go use it because you need to not hold it inside and keep it for yourself. Let me take a quick break to tell you about Freeze Pipe. Today's episode is brought to you by Freeze Pipe, the smoothest hitting pipes and bongs around. Tired of that hot smoke, burning your throat, coughing attacks when you light up? You can check out an ice-cold freeze pipe. Whether you smoke THC or CBD, it's the smoothest, most pleasant way to relax. The secret is the freezable, non-toxic glycerin chamber. It's on the piece. It's, It's an interesting device. It's really impressive when you see it in person. Pop it in the freezer. It's put in there for an hour, and the smoke that passes through it is instantly cooled by over 300 degrees. Take bigger rips and zero chest pain and throat burn. It is freeze pipe. Right, Dawson? For the coldest and smoothest smoking glass pieces around, check out thefreezepipe.com. They make pipes, bubblers, bongs, and more. And be sure to use code Corolla for 10% off your first order. That's thefreezepipe.com. Code Corolla for 10% off your entire order. Did you guys ever get too big too fast? I don't mean too big too fast. I just yeah. mean you're you're playing events locally, schools and socials and yeah. things of that nature, as you said. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the record explodes and you're getting pushed out in front of vastly larger groups. Oh, yeah. Now you've been at it for a number of years and you probably, yeah. and you've been at it for forever cause you're born in the same house. But I mean, <laughs> did you ever get out in front of, you know, 14,000 people or 52,000 people early mm-hmm. and go, wow. Yeah. It's a big jump. Well, over, I mean, uh, yeah, it is a big jump virtually overnight. It wasn't overnight, but it, in a lot of ways it, did feel somewhat like that when the r- record first broke because we had we I, made indie records and we'd been turned down by every label then we finally got signed and playing an unlikely crummy gig in kansas go to the go to la in 96 make this record kind yeah. of you're in your bubble and then that record begins to come out the first single comes out in early 97 and we're just still in the bubble getting ready for release right we're and, like it's really important that we rehearse enough for letterman you know so, it's like we're very like nuts and bolts letterman was the it. first major tv like back right. when letter it was letterman and leno right? right um and and so we were prepared great example is we were preparing like we were kind of in the bubble right we're just the yeah. band from tulsa and we we had a promo show that had already been lined up before the record broke. And we didn't want to go do it because we <laughs> didn't feel like we were ready for the TV show. We showed up at Paramus Park Mall in New Jersey, and um, and every parking spot in this mall was packed. And we thought, what the heck is going on in this mall? We pulled up to the back door of the, I think it was the Macy's, you know, and three rent a cops and the marketing guy from the from the. Um, radio radio station their eyes are like as big as their forehead and like we're going what is going on there were 8,000 people packed into a mall and this was three months ago nobody knew Hanson's name you know and you couldn't physically get to the little you know foot high stage that was set up for us to do an acoustic with PA on a stick so it's it's really uh, almost a criminal that they put us out on there it was not safe you can imagine (laughs) what happens you get out there you walk out 8,000 people, you're on a foot high stage with no barricade and no security, right? You There's play like your three, three guys songs. standing in front of us with mm-hmm. their arms together. You play your three songs, and then the audience goes, Oh, they're done. I'm going to come meet them. Right. All 8,000 8, people. Yeah. It's, it's actually, I mean, you can say that. I don't know if anybody understands what it looks like to have 8,000 people inside of a mall. It's, it's really not something you have to experience. It's like you can feel the human energy pushing on, on in on you. But and also, malls are loud. Yeah, and when they started loud. screaming, that was a level of sound that I've never heard It's since. like Black Friday at Walmart, but <laughs> as far as you can see, they are genuinely killing each other for the I latest I guess only toy. Tiffany would know. Did <laughs> yeah, she start in malls? Yeah. I don't know. But this Maybe. this this was just the promo gig, you know that you know that stuff. What that is is just a radio promo gig that was not not supposed to be a thing, you know. Right. But it was the oh, it was the moment where you went from here and you went. We're never going backwards. Like this, we can't unsee that. And we'd had inklings of it locally because when you played shows at like middle schools and things like that, you'd feel that, you, that they, manic they, they energy. Kind of yeah, yeah, the manic energy happened. So you had some kind of. Some small, small kind of psychological preparation for it, but it was literally a fraction. I mean, I, I, I'm trying like to ten times this. I'm trying to sit here, think back to it, like why we didn't have a total freak out, right? Mm-hmm. You would think I, you would have a, a mental breakdown or yeah. or explode into an ego of just unbelievable proportions, but for some reason, we kind of had it in our mind that that was normal. 
that was the I, next step. That was supposed to happen next, right? I think there's a lot of that same kind of reaction and it varies, but like if you were in a bank and the bank was being robbed by armed <laughs> gunmen, some people scream and other people go, I felt this calm come yes. over me, you know, right, and, and right. all of a sudden it got quiet and you, you have yeah. a different reaction mm -hmm. and you guys may, you know, obviously share mm -hmm. the same DNA yeah. and same nurture and, mm -hmm. and nature. So maybe that was another yeah. gift Maybe we're all super ADD, so our adrenaline's <laughs> really low, and then when the panic hits, we just get really normal. But, but no, also, when you say that, I remember saying, I'm Batman. <laughs> you have a, <laughs> I think you guys have a sense of obligation, right. I would guess, that right. was like, I feel the same way too, which is like, oh, they're here, we have to perform, right. there is no... Sometimes people go, I don't know, I would have got up and turned around and left. It's like, well, you can't leave, they showed up. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And they go, oh, it's no security, no barrier, no thank you, you know? And I'd be like, no, no, you can't leave, these people are here, right. you gotta go, Why? you can't punish them, they they showed up to see you. So you guys 100%. probably grew up with this sense and, and you oh, probably God, yeah. still possess it, this sort of, obligation almost i don't mean in a negative way but a yeah. certain i we're responsible and we said we would do this and we're gonna go do it well even even yeah, more some than people that, call that integrity yeah, yeah. yeah. I, don't I, miss it. I don't know i, I, I would, miss it i yeah. would go further and say too i mean you know not to chew you can't need that because it's not healthy but but it was more oh my god it happened, you know, because mm -hmm. you've watched. I mean, we we sort of studied the Beach Boys and the Beatles and the you know Jackson, Jackson Five, Five and thought and maybe one day, and there you are, and you're looking at it, you're staring at. It. The other thing is, I, I really think a key part of what, like quote unquote, sanity, keeping some degree of balance, is it was our song, you know, mm -hmm. and it was our songs. It's always been our, and so I think you know we just did write you a song. I think the fact that we were that you know we started it so early, which is really really early. But it, we were still saying things that were coming out of us. It wasn't somebody else being like, here's your song, kid. Right. And I think the survival of me mentally, I think that was huge because it allowed us to go back to the, to the hotel room or back to the backstage and, and kind of get connected to the fact that, that we had the ability to succeed or fail kind of on our terms in a way. Like, yes, the next one might not be a smash hit like that one, but it wasn't somebody else that you had to replicate or pretend to be. Do you remember uh, Letterman was shortly thereafter? Was that like the first big TV hit? Yeah, that yeah, was, was the first, first TV. First that was TV. the first one we did. We walked out in our, at the fifty degree temperature and thought, yeah. what's, <laughs> "What's wrong with this guy?" <laughs> I think we did. I think in their time, in the time with Leno and Letterman, I think we played both shows at least seven or eight times over the last. Some I mean, we played them a lot. I think we played Leno more because, amongst other things. Jay was really cool. He was really, you <laughs> very, know, well, very, very, friendly, yeah. very, very personable and, and kind of, I felt, I felt a little bit like we kind of knew the crew really well because they'd, you know, yeah, seen yeah, us yeah. as young kids and then as, you know, teenagers and, you well, know, I mean, for like, you 20 years, you back for these 20 shows, years. You know? Yeah. We were one of the last, I think we were on in one of the last weeks of the of Leno's, of Leno's yeah, show. Probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Leno is a very nice guy. Yeah. And eh, Dave's a little, uh, Dave's Dave. <laughs> Dave's yeah, Dave's you, Dave is feisty. Put you, put you that. Well, you know, I think that's a great. Dave's a not to Dave's talk a genius, more about Cheryl Crow. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, John Popper told me a story about Cheryl Crow. So yeah. just give me ten minutes. <laughs> no, there, but Letterman, it did, it did make me think this because I was watching that doc. The, her first big hit, she yeah. went on Letterman, mm -hmm. and she did uh, Leaving Las Vegas, yeah. and then he like waved her over like, Hey, sit down. And then she sat down next to him and he said to her like, Hey, you live in Las Vegas. Like, how'd you write that song? And she just kind of <laughs> fast out. And she wrote like, uh, yeah, well I wrote that song and blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, did you live in Las Vegas? Like, well, I didn't live there. Did you work there? And she's like, no, she kind of got herself into trouble. Cause she right. said, and then also, she wrote that song with a bunch of other people, yeah. but she yeah. just went like, yeah, oh, when did I write that song? I wrote that song the other day, you know? Yeah. And then the guy who wrote the book, Leaving Las Vegas, saw her on Letterman and killed himself. Oh, my God. The next. What? That's not funny. <laughs> what? Yes. Uh, you can, Chris can find the story, but yeah. so... Leaving Las Vegas was the name wow. of the book. I was about to say left turn at Albuquerque. That's more relevant now. <laughs> yes, Bugs, that's what Bugs Bunny would do, right? Yeah. Like 
He wrote a book. They wrote the song. They kind of wrote it as a group with her yeah, session Tuesday people, Night Music Club. Yeah. Tuesday Night Music Club. Yeah. And then she wasn't prepared when Letterman sort of hit her. And then she kind of got dug in. Like, I wrote the song. And yeah, then she, the guy killed himself. And then all the news stories came out where awful. she didn't write that song. She's yeah. taking credit for it. She was just this young person that got caught up in the lights. And yeah, it for sure. screwed her up. And by the wow. way, to this day, she's being interviewed and she's breaking down into tears because of this crazy well, coincidence story. I never even heard that. But until, she, she's incredibly talented. Oh, my God. Did uh, you guys ever cross paths with her? We, we have gotten very close um, a couple different times, but never have really yeah. interacted. Um, Mr. Frim and Chad Blake are, you know, we're, we loved her, especially her second record was like one of our big, like, we want to work with that team. Um, yeah. And almost made almost made our third record with those guys, and that was through, okay, loving Cheryl Crow. That's the that's the connection point. So that's not us personally, but yeah. big fans of her. And yeah, that's tragic. That's just like, wow. Chris, do you have that story? Yeah, I'm 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 still looking for the exact details, but yeah, it, it, uh, her performing on Letterman was blamed for John O'Brien's suicide. Wow, he, he, was, he was the author. Wow. Well, yeah, wow. I. <laughs> Again, whether it's the roommate who's making fun of you because you're gay or Cheryl Crow going on Letterman, that's probably not the reason you kill yourself. Let's just keep it. There's get a little sanity there. If, 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 If Cheryl Crow can go on Letterman and the following day you can go, you know, it's a good idea. I think I should kill myself. There's probably some underlying pre-existing series of things feelings and things going on before that so you guys are but it's a crazy story you'll you'll see it in the doc and crazy crazy world i felt bad for her and and it was weird it's like once letterman found out that she wasn't from las vegas and that the song wasn't about leaving las vegas because she never was in las vegas he just kept digging in and you could see now how uncomfortable she was. Yeah, but I think Letterman liked making people uncomfortable. Yes. He, right? Yes. You know, like, he was like, he deliberately liked poking fun at you and well, you being the joke in a weird a way. a certain kind of dark humor. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes. He was I've very snarky in it. that way. So you, did, you guys, I did Letterman twice in, I don't know, however many years. But you guys have probably done it a bunch of times, yeah. right? Yeah. We've well, done it a bunch a of times. times. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. lucky that we have each other to play off of, right? We're rarely doing that alone. And so when somebody sort of <laughs> comes at you in a weird way, you're usually playing off each other. I'm usually responsible for saying most of the things that people regret, not not the interviewer. Or, or Zach is usually Three responsible for, for, the, for the dig that... Gets, that goes too far. Well, or they dig that gets people to back off too. Oh, oh, you're, yeah. you're you're the king of like you know. Oh, you say something feisty, I'll say something even feistier. I'm laughing at people committing suicide. Yeah, I know you, you found that hysterical. <laughs> but again, well, just wow. shocking. Pre-existing. Just shocking. There's, well, speaking of karma, being a bitch, Zach, you got in a bad motorcycle accident. I did. I did. Not yeah. too long ago. You know that's that's that brick one wall of those came out of nowhere. <laughs> just wish, Man, one of those stories I wish would you know. I never thought I'd be repeating that. Yeah, I broke my collarbone and my shoulder blade in a couple spots and some ribs. And, uh, you know, I just didn't quite make the turn on a Ducati and just kind of hit a brick wall. You should explain that a little bit more. I was right behind it. I'm not going to go there. There's lots of reasons. Everybody that rides motorcycles know you're going to go down at some point. Yes. I just hope for your sake that, you know, you're wearing, I was wearing good gear. So, you know, my shoulder protector protected my shoulder from being shattered and, you know, you're going to go down. It's part of the joy of doing it. That sort of the living on the edge a the little risk. bit, right? It's it's a calculated risk. It's like skydiving, you know? Well, you're, no, you're, you're, that you're too, a car right? guy and a bike guy. It, it, yes. It's an interesting discussion because it, you know, everyone tells you, we both have bikes. We, we now both have Triumph Bonnevilles, you know, just great bikes, solid bikes, nothing crazy. But, but they, you know, it's not quote unquote safe, but I think that it's the energy of the adrenaline. It's the, it, it, I think partly what makes it appealing. It's like you're, you're putting yourself like you, the wind and just like a rocket underneath your. Legs. Well, I, you <laughs> know, and not to get uh, too spiritual about it. And by the way, <laughs> congratulations on being the only guy in Oklahoma with a Ducati. No, there are, there are, there's a lot of Ducatis in Oklahoma. No, well, no, we all not. have to drive to Texas to get them. Yes. All right. Well, so I, there's not an embargo. There's just probably not a big market for no, Ducatis. No, there's just not, and unfortunately. I, I have this thought, which I used to ride motorcycles a lot and street bikes a lot. 
you know, just sort of Ninja 600s and right. Honda 404s, like older, cool. older stuff. But, and I, I do some racing on occasion. And you do have this thought that if you just turned your right hand and, and opened the throttle up, and by the way, I don't like it when athletes celebrate in the end zone by doing the two-handed yeah. throttle. There's no motorcycle <laughs> pose. Get it, get it right, John. It's one. It's, it's one. Not, they go like, Woo! They do both hands. I'm like, you don't, whose bike is on your left that you're mussing with their throttle? <laughs> but... That aside, uh, it's why everything can ru- I, everything's ruined for me because even if my right. team scores a touchdown, if they do the two hand throttle, yes, I'm up out. and I'm you're angry. I'm, I'm throwing a beer at the TV set. But <laughs> y- you have this thought that if I keep my right foot pressed down for another three and a half seconds, or my right hand turn for another three and a half seconds, I can kill myself going through this wall or off this race course or off the back of the whatever. And, and it's almost like flying in a military jet. Like all I got to do is push down on the yoke, count to five and And there's a huge ball of fire. (laughs) Yep. And, but you control that. Yeah. And thank God you didn't write leaving Las Vegas because you're, you're, oh, you're there you no, go. but I'm there just saying go. you're, you're going to keep that hand on the yoke <laughs> yeah. and not push it forward. But you are the, yeah. you are in control of that. And so in a weird way, going really fast on a motorcycle or going really fast in a race car, sometimes it's kind of like playing God in the sense yeah. that you're really in charge of not only your fate, but if you're doing a race, you're in charge of a lot of other people around you or mm-hmm. whoever you're riding with or whoever's on the back of the bike or whatever, whatever it is. Yeah, and right. it's an, it's a kind of a weird complex of like, you are really in charge. And unlike other facets of life where you can kind of look down at your phone for a second and go like, oh, hold on, let me do You can't do that. But that's the, that's the appeal of it, right? You can, or that's the ball of fire. <laughs> oh, that's the ball of fire. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's the focus. It's the Z it's a kind of Zen almost like you yeah. are present or else. <laughs> well, I right. remember my seven year anniversary with my wife. She took me to get our concealed carry license, right? Yeah. We're from Oklahoma. And so carrying a gun, going to course to carry a gun. And I remember when I, the first time I carried a gun in public, thinking, I have a gun and no one knows I have a gun. There's like all this responsibility and all this like purpose and things that are like, just everything changes and you start thinking about what other people are doing. And right. I think motorcycles is is kind of similar in the sense of I could die any moment, that person over there is on their phone, right? And and you're very present in a way that I think is powerful and positive. And I think the idea for people is to figure out ways to synthesize and create that presence minus the ball of fire (laughs) or the gun going off at the club when you're going to the bathroom or whatever, (laughs) minus that. But, but, but do not try to eliminate that danger because that danger is really life affirming. Yeah. It's, it's, you're not living in, unless you're, you know, a lot of that, that edge is, is kind of, okay, now I'm really alive. I mean, you've never felt more alive than, I mean, Zach and I jumped out of a plane a couple of times. I mean, doing the, with a parachute. Um, (laughs) That's why they're still here. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not crazy fan of that. I thought I had fun, but it was my favorite thing in the world but man i my adrenaline was like for two days you just kind of are walking around like uh, ready and yeah. i think there's something strange about that 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 we do crave some degree of that ch- taking those well because it creates a level of focus and that is really powerful for that matter performance as much as i'd like to not actually say it's, so it's true it's something it there is an we are getting a big thing. you're getting an adrenaline shot you're getting this in, intense adrenaline energy. and dopamine yeah, so yeah. two very very uh, powerful drugs. <laughs> the uh, red, sorry, I should give the album name out. Red, green, blue. We have another offering that you guys uh, recorded slightly earlier in the day in this mm-hmm. studio. And I'll throw to this one. It's uh, Taylor's from Taylor's Pill. <laughs> red Pill. <laughs> red, red Pill. <laughs> Child pill. at Heart. You can just breathe. You are no mistake. Though you feel it's strange Just give your heart away Like you're not afraid To face another day Though you feel far You can chase the star 
Guys, that sounded so great. Like I said, uh, I heard it in real time just, uh, I don't know, 45 <laughs> minutes ago. Uh, it's always a treat when you guys come into the studio. I just dig your vibe so much. And please come back anytime. Hey, thank thanks you so like. much for having us. Uh, you can uh, shoot them a tweet at Hanson Music and know that they're going to be doing a tour in Europe and in the U.S. And where should people go if they want to find Hanson.net is the best place to find all the information, but we're on all the social media stuff, you know, at Hanson or Hanson Music. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. Always a treat. And it's always such a treat when you play for me and for the fans here in my mm-hmm. studio. Isaac Taylor and Zach. Until next time, this is Adam Carolla saying mahalo. The weddings were the dudes in a suit, but then he's wearing like flip flops with the suit. I don't yeah, like fuck that. that guy. I don't like any precocious nine year olds wearing Wayfair sunglasses. Yeah. Like, oh, he's a bad dude. Too cool. You know, I. Yeah. If your all... wedding's on the beach in Hawaii, flip flop it up. Go crazy. Yeah. If you're in a fucking skate park getting married, fans <laughs> all day. Otherwise, right. show some goddamn respect. <laughs>